Gracious Heavenly Father, we just come into your presence by means of our Lord Jesus Christ and in the Holy Spirit. So very grateful for who you are and all you've done in our lives. We just give you all the glory and the honor and the praise. Filter out that which is foolish, seal to our hearts only that which is truth, that we might grow in grace and knowledge of you. For it's in Christ's name I pray. Amen. Hi, this is Steve at BlessedHopeForever.com. We are slowly going through 2 Corinthians verse by verse. We've been looking at the comfort of God and the grace of God. I pointed out to you early in this study that we find the Holy Spirit pointing out for us that Paul was without peace, that he left a very effective work at Troas, where that the Spirit uh, apparently was moving, and he went hunting for Titus. And by the time we uh, get to the seventh chapter of this epistle, we'll find that, uh, that what he mentioned to us in the second chapter is what happened in the seventh chapter. He met Titus and he heard about the effectiveness of the Word of God there at Corinth. Now, I suggested to you that we learn some lessons out of that, that that the Holy Spirit is vastly more concerned about the well-being of God's children than He is the proclamation of the Gospel. We find that uh, much of the Word of God, and in fact, by far and away, the major portion of the Scriptures is centered in the growth, the nurture, and the edification of God's children. In the second chapter, we, we had a great elevation of praise, uh, a burst of praise is what I would call it, to God for what had happened in Corinth. When we got to the fourth chapter, we were told that we have a grand message. We have this fantastic news, this super, super news, tremendous uh, news compared to the administration of the law that there was a ministration of death, a ministration of condemnation. However, our message, a message of grace, is just the opposite. It's a message of liberty. It's a message of freedom. It's a message of completion. Colossians chapter 2, ye are complete in him. And there are no conditions on that. Dearly beloved, there are no conditions on that. It's humans who put conditions on it. The Holy Spirit did not. You are complete because His work is complete. And that is a marvelous message. And we found out as we began the chapter that there would be a great temptation to practice deceit. And I keep going over this uh, because I believe it's very important in your life and in your ministry, as well as my life and my ministry. Now, the Holy Spirit very clearly stated Uh, in the fourth chapter that we have this ministry and since we've received mercy, we don't become discouraged. And I, I suggested, you know, why, why should anybody become discouraged in the proclamation of this great grand news of liberty and grace? Well, because people don't listen. 
lives aren't changed. We want to see more. And so we're tempted to use deceit to get people through the gates of glory, which, uh, for as a matter of record, has never worked, never will. Countless numbers of Christians, multitudes of Christians, rationalize that kind of thing. You know, if we can just get the, the famous athletes and the movie stars converted and, and you know, and the leaders of the, the human race converted, then, then, well, then all of the other sheep will follow suit. That's the second verse of this chapter. We don't resort to shameful tactics. What do we know? We know that God's children will hear and that those who are not God's children will not hear. That's what the text says. If the gospel isn't heard, it's because it's been hidden from them by the God of this world. I suggested that Satan. But God commanded the light to shine in darkened hearts. And, and hey, listen, if God commanded it to shine, it's, it's going to shine. There is no way that you can convince me that in Genesis 1, when God said, let there be light, that it didn't happen. If God said, let there be light, there's going to be light. If God commands light to shine in darkened hearts, it'll shine. And folks, if you are still so trapped in the snare of believing that God's will is not as strong as, as yours, as man's will, I, I find it hard to believe that you've ever read the, this book. You don't have to be discouraged if your message isn't heard, ever. There's no reason for discouragement. There's no reason for shameful tactics. There's no reason for deceit. There's no reason for the tricks of the trade. You know, for, for Christians to get together and say, well, you know, we have, we have a super product to sell. Now let's learn how to package it and, and let's learn how to present it. You know, like as if it was some ordinary commodity. Folks, we have nothing to sell. Absolutely nothing. We have nothing to give away. We have nothing to share. And, and boy, the, I mean, the popular movement today is, is share your faith. You know, I know I'll, I'll probably get in trouble here on this, but folks, I don't have enough faith to share. No place in God's Word can you find anything about sharing your faith. That people just made that up, okay? The concept of the Word of God is our proclamation of the Gospel, the message of grace. And we are saved by grace and by grace alone. I pointed out that we are ambassadors for Christ, well, what does an ambassador do? Well, he never speaks of himself. He's an ambassador for Christ. His presentation is a presentation of the finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ. Not his own personal existential experiences. We then ended the fourth chapter that said, Basically, that, that if you're a true minister of the gospel of Jesus Christ, if that's what you're involved in, if that is your vocation, if that is your life, your message, your ministry, if that is your me message, your ministry, then you are despised, you're rejected, you're troubled, you're perplexed, you're distressed, you're cast off, you're the filth, the offscouring of the, of the world religious system based on human merit. You are the off-scouring of the church system. But modern evangelism doesn't want to be the off-scouring of any system. 
It, it wants to be the popular movement. And I'll say this again, and I say it unapologetically, folks, I believe with all of my heart, if you find anything that is humanly popular, it's not of the Holy Spirit. And that is a devastating thought. You'd have to compare that with what the words say. The chapter ended by saying that the way that we run our ministry is looking not at things that are seen. How do we run our ministry? We look not at the things that are seen. Now sure, that can be the, the effects in your daily life, the, the broken bones or the, you know, or the cancer you know, or whether it rains or whether it snows or, or, you know, or how many subs that Blessed Hope Forever has or, or the, even the sin in your life, what appears as failure from the human standpoint. But in light of the context, and I have pushed this so heavily, it's more likely what's seen in your work for Christ, in your service, in the ministry of Jesus Christ. Don't look at the things that are seen. You know, this preacher here, he got, he got, he got millions of views, but this, this guy only here, over here, he only got a few hundred. So, you know, we better call him to speak at, at the next national conference so that he can teach others how to be more effective. Folks, how do we determine how effective a person is? My text says that we don't look at things that are seen. The context is our ministry. The context here is ministry. We look at things that are not seen. The things which are seen are temporal. The things which are not seen are eternal. Now, it, it is, it's from that context that we went into the fifth chapter. Now, dearly beloved, I am not asking anyone to agree with me here today on anything that I say about this passage. I just want to study the Word just like you. I'm not going to get more green stamps if you agree with me, and I, I am not the least bit interested in developing a following or seeing any great work so that I can, you know, look back and I can say, boy, I was mightily used of the Holy Spirit. No. Don't even try to agree. Just study this book. Study the Word of God with me. In your own time, study the text. Because what's important for you is to learn what this book says and what it means and if the Holy Spirit can use our studies together to sharpen this to a point, to, to develop both of us in the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ and the growth in grace, then praise God. But don't just believe something just because I say it. I suggested to you that I do not believe the regular assumptions taken in the verse in the first verses one, two, and three, and four, and five are correct. Okay, the regular assumption is that our house of this tabernacle is your human body, and when you die, you have a glorified body in heaven. That's not only the popular thesis, but it even pervades secular literature. This is one passage of Scripture that even occurs in the writing of non-believers. This is a very popular sermon text for ministers speaking about the rapture. You know, that, that Paul really wasn't sure that he'd live until the rapture. You know, he might and he might not. And that he would receive a glorified body at the rapture. Folks, I don't think that's the meaning. 
Now we did have a brief interruption in our study here, but when we left the fourth chapter, we were looking not at the things that are seen, but at the things that are not seen. For we know that if our earthly, our tent house here on earth, that's, that's the way I translate it, We know that if our earthly tent house here on earth, uh, and, and well, what must that mean? I mean, that must be the things that are seen. Dearly beloved, if I'm going to follow the context, remember the chapter division wasn't there in, in the original text. Well, the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. For we know that if our temporary house here on earth were destroyed, then we present tense, present tense, already have a building not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. Already got it. So the things which are seen must be the things here on earth. Now, of course, that could be the body. I mean, surely the body is seen. But it, it seems to indicate, or it, that seems to violate the context to say that we're spending our time in our, in our service and in our ministry looking at our bodies. You know, it doesn't make any sense to me. I would think that the context, it makes more sense to say that a supreme temptation to the one who has a ministry, and I believe we all have a ministry, that seeing that we have this ministry, and, and you can say, well, that isn't me. I, I, believe, I believe every one of you, to some degree, has a ministry from God. You're, you're at least an ambassador for Christ. You know, you and I could spend our time in that ministry looking at the things which we are seeing. Well, how do you define that? Well, okay, we, uh, let's see, we burned the mortgage, you know, last year on the church. We, we just paved our entire parking lot, cost us 14 grand you know, to do that, and, and we did this, and we did that, and, and, and our membership increased by 30%. And, and, and folks, we can go on and on and on and on with that. But what are we doing? We're looking at things that are seen. Now, my context says, that's not the way to run my ministry. You know, how many people did you lead to the Lord last month? Now, I don't know. I don't know. The Holy Spirit does that. You know, I, I was actually, you believe this or not, I was actually in a, a church meeting in Arkansas where they had a cash register that they rang souls up on the cash register. I know that's, that's kind of extreme, but you know, that's looking at things that are seen. We don't spend our time in the ministry looking at things that are seen but the things that are not seen. And I, folks, I think that is beautiful. I think that's wonderful. For we know that if, and that's a third class condition, the third class condition says maybe it will, maybe it won't. It's, it's in the subjunctive mood in the Greek, the mood of uncertainty. We have a building of God, a house not made with hands eternal in the heavens. Eternal. So think long term here, eternal, as in what lasts. Think, think quality, not quantity. Okay. Now you can say that, well, Steve, what that means is, well, maybe you'll live to the rapture and maybe you won't. But folks, I can argue that the context is ministry. Now, the, the scriptures do declare that we shall not all sleep, 
are, will not all die, but we shall all be changed. Now, if that means anything, it tells me that the glorified body is not the, the unglorified body. God's not going to defile heaven by taking your carnal hide to heaven. So, if this passage deals with your body, there should be no third class condition. Because your body will be dissolved because you're going to have a glorified body. The one's not going to glory. Our new one is like his glorious body. So that seems to say that it really isn't the body. Third, it seems to say that whatever we're looking at here, this tabernacle, this, uh, this tent house on earth, that it might remain. It might remain. Now, in 1 Corinthians, we are told, if any man's works fail, he'll suffer loss, yet he himself shall be delivered. He'll be saved, yet so as through fire. Now, for those who uh, would suggest that a man's work, works can get him to hell, he'd have to suggest that these works could put him in heaven. 1 Corinthians 3 clearly says that even if they fail, he'll be delivered, yet so as by fire. 1 Corinthians 3 clearly says that there is a work that remains and there is a work that fails. And here, here's a third class condition that says maybe, maybe what we're building in this ministry will stay and maybe it won't. In either case, we have a house in glory. I cannot emphasize enough the context the next thing is it says is, is that one in glory is not made with hands. The one, it's, there's one not made with hands. That leaves me only two options, okay? That if this is my human body, then, then made with hands means, well, it means, it means my mother and my father, you know, getting together and, and deciding that I'd be born. Or much more logical, in my opinion, that, that made with hands, folks, is my work. My work. Not His. My work. According to the grace of God which is given unto me as a wise master builder, says Paul, I have laid the foundation and another builds thereon, but let every man take heed how he builds thereupon. For no other foundation can um, any man lay than, than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. If his work endures, he'll receive a, a reward. If it fails, well, he's still delivered. So it would appear to me that what is consistent with other scriptures, what, what we're really looking at in the opening paragraph here of chapter 5, is the result of this ministry. We've been uh, talking about all through chapter four. And it may endure, and it may not. If you are looking on the outward appearances, and, and boy, those can be everything from, uh, I mean, gosh, we spend all day listing all. It could be everything from the flesh, what, what appears to be failure, uh, which really isn't, or, or the number of conversions, you know, to the size of the church building or the number of church buses or, or whatever, whatever it might be. Then it seems to me that that, uh, that puts that in, in the context of that which is going to be dissolved. The word dissolved there. Is, is set loose, is what the word literally means. 
It has nothing to do with perishing or going to hell or anything like that. Next, uh, it seems to say, or, or does, does say to me in the text, you know, if it doesn't to you, fine, but it says to me in the, in the text that I already have this permanent dwelling in heaven. That's what the grammar says. I already got it. Whereas the scriptures would lead me to believe that, that nobody's yet, nobody yet has a glorified body except Christ and that we're, uh, we're all going to get them, that, those glorified bodies together. And so the tenses would seem to indicate to me that I already have whatever that is in heaven. Okay? And the Lord Jesus Christ told me that He prepared for me a permanent dwelling in glory. I'm certain that I have a permanent body in glory also. But I do not believe that that's what Christ was talking about when He discussed this very very exact same subject with his disciples. Next, I'm told in verses 2 and 4 that in this, this one, we groan. The, the word groan is a, is a really interesting word. You can, you can translate it in lots of ways. For example, you, you saw it in verse 8 of chapter 4. You know, we're troubled on every side, yet not distressed. You know, uh, we absolutely do not groan. Same word as in verse 2 of, of chapter 5. For in this we groan. Four, chapter 4 says that we're troubled on every side and we don't groan. 5 says in this we absolutely do groan. Isn't that interesting? So, it would look to me like that we groan because of the temporary nature of this dwelling, this tent, this life that we're working out here. In verse 4, we're also told that in this dwelling we groan being burdened that we should not be unclothed, you know, that is found naked, but clothed upon. And you know, in our minds just automatically just want to run off to heaven. And I, I don't I don't I can't blame Christians for that. But folks, look, verse two, for in this we groan, earnestly desiring. Okay, right? now now let's let's translate that that fairly, okay? To clothe ourselves. That's an aorist tense. Aorist tense. Middle voice. Middle voice. With our house, which is from heaven. So that doesn't seem to fit a glorified body. I'm told that we do the putting on. You know, we put off the old man, put on the new man. We're, we do the putting on, whereas the glorified body is a gift from God. He'll give us a body like unto His own glorified body. But here is a dwelling, okay? We're going to move into ourselves. I would assume that, that we don't put on the human body, therefore we don't put on the glorified body. We do build a life into which we, we move. Uh, we do, okay? And I think that's the kind of ministry that's been built around your work for Jesus Christ. Paul says, I've laid a foundation which is Christ, which is Christ Jesus the Lord. Nobody else can lay an, a, another foundation other than that one. The effort that we expend is the made with hands. That's my hands. But the results of that effort, God does. We found that in 1 Corinthians 3. I'm talking about the effort that you expend, not the result of that effort. And we're going to pick up here next time. Uh, and uh, Lord willing, I love you all. I truly do. Rest in Him. Until next time, this is Steve. Thanks for watching.